Paul, I was thinking it was too bad that him didn't have a few more verses because we were getting it by the third verse. <laughs> we, we were there by the third verse. So. Well, good morning, soldiers. How goes the war? Mm. Battle weary, bloodied, and bandaged? Or making progress? Or are you being driven back, outflanked, outwitted by a wily enemy? Maybe you're here this morning feeling pretty good about your standing in the war and your battle. Now, I'm not speaking about the battle of politics. Let's be clear about that. We're not talking about the battle between Republicans and Democrats. We're not talking about the battle between income and expenses either, debits and credits. We're not even talking about the battle of the bulge, you know, the war of the waistline. <laughs> well, maybe we are. <laughs> what we're speaking about is the battle of sin versus holiness. That's the battle we speak of. The war of our will versus God's will. Fellow Christian, comrade in arms, band of brothers and sisters, our commander in chief has spoken. We have our marching orders. We have our strategic objectives. And we have today before us great help, great help in this war of sin versus holiness. Will you open your war manual to 1 Peter chapter 1? 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's hear the instructions and the motivations and the helps this morning from our Commander-in-Chief. Verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Well, there's no doubt what this passage is about. The word holy is used four times in three verses. There is no doubt about what the main thrust of this passage is. It's found in the imperative. It's found in the command of verse 15. Here is the big idea. Be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Everything else supports that, revolves around that. That is the sun of this solar system of words in this short passage. It is a decisive call to holiness. It is a do it now kind of command. Don't put this off. There is an urgency here. And the idea behind this command is, ye, plural, show yourselves to be holy. Demonstrate yourselves to be holy. Manifest what's on the inside so that it comes out on the outside of your life and behavior. That's the idea here. It's not that he's writing to people who are blatantly unholy, unsaved people. And he says, now you've got to really straighten up and clean up your life. No, he's writing to Christians who are making progress in their sanctification, and he's saying to them, now put on display in your practice what is your position, right? You are positionally holy. You are saints. Now show that to be the case. This is number two of five imperatives that come rapid fire beginning in verse 13 that take us into the front edge of chapter 2. We talked about that last time. Five straight commands that come from Peter based on our salvation. Okay, God has done this for you. God has been merciful and saved you and you're born again. Now, as a result, you are to live this way and I am to live this way. The first of these five imperatives, if you were here last week, was hope. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you. The second one is holiness. And it is the first that leads to the second, right? Just like John says in 1 John 3, 1 and 2. He talks about the coming of the Lord and he says, Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. 
And so our hope is a purifying hope. It is a hope that leads to holiness. We see the same pattern here in Peter. So what he is telling us then is we need to be, as we're living a hope-filled life on grace that's coming to us, verse 13, we need to be living a life that gets ready to see the Savior. We need to be living in such a way that we can be interrupted at any time. We need to be making progress in Christ's likeness because we may see Him. We may see Him at any moment. And when we see pure holiness, listen, we're going to be wanting to be pretty close to that, as close as we can become in this life. So what is the thrust then? What is the big idea? Here it is. I'm going to give you some synonyms, give you some other words to get our minds around this. Consecrate yourself to God, not sin. Dedicate your time, your talents, your treasure, your all in all. Dedicate yourself to God, not the world. Separate yourself from all that defiles and give yourself over to God as the only one deserving of such dedication. You see, God is dedicated, God is separated, and now we are to dedicate ourselves to the one who deserves that. If you were to observe the life of a singer, an entertainer, that did 350 concerts a year, and some of them, it's amazing, some of them get close to this, don't they? If you were to observe that life, you would say, that person is dedicated to music. That person is dedicated to entertainment. If you were to observe the life of a writer who sits at a keyboard and works on his craft 10 hours a day, six days a week, cranking out novels, you would say that person is consecrated to the production of novels. If you went to a gym and observed a bodybuilder spending six hours a day, every day in the gym, you would say that person is dedicated to this thing, and by being dedicated to this, they are, by definition, rejecting a bunch of other stuff that they could be doing, and they're not doing, because they're consecrated. Now, each one of these illustrates for us what it means to be consecrated to a calling. But each one of those, as, as outlandish as they may sound to most of us, each one of those is easy compared to five minutes in the war of holiness, moral holiness, consecration to God. Why is that? Why is holiness so hard? Well, it brings us back each and every time to the big three enemies that we face. You see, everything in this world, everything about this fallen world system all of it works against our holiness. It works against our otherness, our separateness, and it wants to conform us into its pattern. That's what the world's about. And then everything in our, everything in our flesh, because Paul said in Romans 7, no good thing dwells in my flesh. Everything in my fallen flesh hates holiness, despises it, wants anything other than living pure before God. And then there's the unholy devil who is thoroughly unholy and he wants nothing more than unholy Christians who trash their testimonies, who live defeated lives. That's what we're up against. That's why five minutes of the war of holiness is harder than a lifetime of some other consecration. All of that to say we need help. I hope you know that as you walked in the today, that you and I need lots of help in this, we got to have God's gracious provision moment by moment to answer what is a summons to a sinless life. I mean, when the Bible says, Be holy, for I am holy, beloved, that's a summons to a sinless life. It is. We can't take the edge off of that. We can't water it down. We can't compromise it with all of this, yeah, but, and all of these excuses. That's what we're called to, that's the target. That's the goal. Complete perfection. Complete holiness. As it's found in God Himself. And so we need help, do we not? If we're going to prosecute this pursuit of perfection, if we're going to wage this war of all wars, we need help. And, and I want to set before you what has been become to me an amazing passage this week. 
an amazing passage that sets before us five helps in our pursuit of holiness. Number one, know your identity. Know your identity. He begins, verse 14, as obedient children. A literal translation would be, as children of obedience. This is so precious. This is like one of the best of the five right off the bat. He's saying, in as much as you are children of obedience, live like it. Be holy. This is not the call to holiness. This is the foundation of the call. This is the starting point of the call. Know your identity. You are, by definition, as a believer, you are a child of obedience. Now this takes us back to the beginning of this letter. On the same page, of, I'm, I'm assuming, of your Bible, verses 1 to 3 of this chapter. Peter writes to those aliens who are scattered in these various places who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Verse 2, by the sanctifying, there's our root word holy, work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Why? Why did God choose us? Why did the Spirit set us apart? What does the text say? To obey Jesus Christ and be forgiven, be sprinkled with His blood. And so that's where this is all rooted, in what God has done for us, what God has declared about us. We are then, by identity, children of obedience. This is a common Hebraism. It means this, our ruling nature and our characteristic spirit is one of obedience. It is. We are no longer sons of disobedience who are dead in their sins, right? Who live according to the course of this world, Ephesians 2, 2. See, Paul refers there to people who are under the wrath of God and he calls them sons of disobedience. No, we are children of obedience. That is our ruling nature. That is our characteristic spirit. We are now sons of light. We are now sons of day. We are not sons of darkness and sons of night. 1 Thessalonians 5. As he begins the letter, verse 3, he says we've been caused to be born again. We've been birthed. We've become a child of God. Verse 3. And it is because of this, it is because we are born again, that we now have the impulse to obey. We now have the desire to obey. We now have the ability to obey. We are children of obedience. This is who we are. I look in the mirror. I'm looking at a saint. I'm looking at a holy one. I'm looking at a person who has a ruling nature and a characteristic spirit of obedience. This is what marks the Christian. You got to believe this. You got to know this. You can't be doubtful about this. You can't be vague about this. You've got to know that when you consider yourself in the war against sin, that your deepest impulse and your greatest desire is to obey Jesus Christ. That is why God saved you and me. See, our identity here is crystal clear, our identity here is specific. And this is such good news. This just has put a smile on my face this week. Every time I have meditated on it. <laughs> when I'm coming at this war against sin, when I'm fighting for holiness in my life, I'm doing so from a position of strength. <laughs> I'm doing so from a position of this is who I am. I don't have to become something that I'm not. I just act out of the depths of who I am because I have a new heart and I have a new spirit put within me, that of the Holy Spirit. Listen, you can't be like Lily Tomlin who quipped one time. She said, I've always wanted to be somebody, but I see now I should have been more specific. <laughs> you are somebody, okay? Believer, I'm talking to you right now. You are somebody, and that somebody is a saint with a ruling spirit and a characteristic bent toward obedience. You've got to know your identity. You've got to know your identity. Some of you are having an identity crisis this morning. I want to tell you that the crisis is over, okay? The crisis is solved. 
You are a child of obedience. That's who you are. That's how you live a holy life. You've got to know what you are. Some of you are moping around this morning, wallowing in sin like the devil has stolen your identity. I'm telling you today, in the name of Jesus, take it back. Take back your identity. Have you seen that cute all-state insurance commercial? It's touting their college scholarship fund. I mean, I completely lose the message because the commercial is so cute. It's, it's this commercial with these various scenes with these parents that are teaching their toddlers and their babies the, their favorite cheer of their college team, all right? And so you've got this scene of this dad out in the yard with a, with a TP of his team with logo all over it, and he's got this one-year-old, it looks like, with this Arkansas Razorback little hat over his head, and the dad's behind it, and he just yells, Pig Suey! And the little child is running off, pulling off the hat with tears running down his eyes, you know. And then the next scene is this wild-eyed father with his Alabama red hat and his Alabama shirt, and even his beard is red and his hair is red, and he's leaning over into a baby crib saying, Roll Tide, you know, and he's got this intensity look. And then the camera pans around into the crib, and it's this baby. I mean, it's an infant with an Alabama onesie on. And, it, and the dad says, roll tight, and the baby just and spits up everywhere. <laughs> this is it's a great commercial. The last scene is this four-year-old in the back of a car on the way to the game. And he's ringing his Mississippi State cowbell in the car. And mom's got this look of migraine exasperation in the passenger seat. And dad is driving, and he's got this big old smile on his face. <laughs> he's like, this is great. But the narrator of the commercial gets it all wrong. The narrator says at the beginning, it says they weren't born Cardinal, Tiger, or Hog fans. And as soon as I heard that, I said, I disagree. They were, they just didn't know it. (laughs) These parents are teaching them to become what they already are. You're going to embrace what you've been born into. Child, you will wear the colors. You will hear the stories. You will learn the vocabulary. You will adopt the lifestyle. Become what you are. So it is with us. We have been born again, verse 3, to a living hope. We are children of obedience. Born again into a life of holiness. Become what you are. Wear the colors inside and out. Learn the stories. Bear the name. Adopt the lifestyle. This is who you are in Christ. That is the first help. It's a huge one. As obedient children. Number two. We pick it back up in verse 14. Second help. We go from know your identity to number two. Resist your propensities. He says in verse 14, do not be conformed to the, this is a huge word in the Bible, folks, former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. Here we are told we must resist our propensities. This is both a prelude to the pursuit of holiness, and it's part of the pursuit of holiness. In other words, there can be no verse 15 without verse 14. There can be no pursuing Christ's likeness without fighting former lusts and resisting former or previous propensities of your life. Every decision we make to be holy is a decision not to do 100 other things. And the 100 other things are your former lusts that you and I must fight. Lust, I know I don't have to define this for most of us, but lust is any ungodly passion. It's any strong desire that is evil or excessive. Lust arises from our natural appetites of the flesh. Life becomes then an all-consuming pursuit of satisfying and gratifying these natural appetites, indulging our pleasures as the world would encourage us to do. Before long then, as we grow up, and it doesn't take long at all, we become dominated by our natural appetites. 
We live for the flesh. This is the person given over to their lust. The very nature of lust and sin then is we run to excess. We sink deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. Peter is saying to us here, we must resist these. We must fight back against this pattern, this scheme, this, this mold that is trying to squeeze us and keep us in its former ways and patterns. Now lust can be for all kinds of things, practically anything. You can lust after sexual pleasure and it becomes all-consuming fornication, serial adultery, pornography. You can lust for alcohol, it becomes drunkenness. You can lust for food, it becomes gluttony. You can lust for power over people, it becomes abuse. You can lust to win, it becomes idolatry. You can lust for people even to feel sorry for you. You can lust for people to make much of you. You can lust after cars and trucks and houses and shoes and clothes and gadgets and money and trophy whitetail bucks and largemouth bass and ski slopes. and It's endless. It's endless the things that we can have an inordinate or evil desire for. Now, here's what you must hear. As a believer, though you are saved, though you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, your former lusts, those specific propensities of your flesh will continue to try to squeeze you into its mold. They are not going away without a fight. You cannot pretend that just because you're now a believer that you will never do this thing again or that you will never struggle with this thing again because these former lusts are still doing war against our souls. We must fight them. We must push back against these previous propensities. we got to know ourselves first. got to know where we're vulnerable. we got to know where we can be outflanked. And we've got to be on guard against these former lusts. And my former lusts are not your former lusts. You've got to know what yours are. And they can be practically anything. Beloved, this passage is calling us to unleash a holy war on these lurking lusts. They're around every corner. They're just waiting to to pounce on us. I think of what God said to Cain. Sin is crouching at the door. You must master it. It is waiting to pounce upon you and dominate you. Now, I told you last week about five bee stings I recently endured. There were many more where those five came from. Thankfully, I was able to flee that situation. After recovery, the next day, I made my way down to Gibson's and I found me a can of stuff. And and I went back to the scene of the crime. And I emptied that can. And I came in the house and I held the can out in victory to my wife. And I proudly announced... Vengeance is mine. I will repay. (laughs) Those bees are like lust. They sting, but we must kill them. They may sting us, but we kill them. We mortify them. We crush them. We fight against them. You've got to engage in a holy war. Peter is telling us here that our former lusts create a pattern or a scheme or a mold by which they try to to squeeze us in and what he's telling us to do is to break the mold develop a new normal in your life shatter the mold of your former lusts the Bible says that a dog returns to its vomit and that a hog returns to wallow in the mire and I'm telling you Believer in Christ, that you are not a dog and you are not a hog. You are a child of obedience. Amen? Amen. Amen. I am not returning to wallow in the mire because that's not who I am. Help number three. This one's important. We'll spend a little more time here than the others. Help number three is to set no limits on your holiness. Look at the passage. I told you the main thrust, the big idea was be holy there in verse 15. But look what else he says at the end of the verse. Be holy yourselves also in 
all your behavior. I regret to inform you that all, no I don't, I'm happy to inform you that all means all. All your behavior means all your life, all your walk, all your doings, all of your activity. The third help for us from this passage is we can set no limits on a life of holiness. This is the stunning scope of our holiness. This is the comprehensive call to holiness. And it just comes with the territory, right? I mean, in this, by definition, what holiness is, I mean, how can you partially be set apart? In all your behavior means all of life. This means every word. Every word should be set apart from sin to God. Every thought, every action, every reaction. Set apart from sin, set apart to God. That's the concise definition of holiness. Holiness can't ever be halfway Holiness cannot be part-time. It cannot be sort of. It cannot be maybe. It cannot be indecisive. Listen, you can't go all Terrell Owens on us here and take a play off. you got to line up and play every play. There is no time off when it comes to the pursuit of holiness. The goal must be total holiness. No limits. No borders. No boundaries. There's no area of my life off limits. There's no dark corners. There's no secret stuff under the rug. There's no secret rooms. There's no hidden sin. Holiness has got to permeate everything or it's not holiness. This is by definition. If we aim low, we will sink into sin beyond imagination. If we aim for mediocre, we'll probably hit low. But if we aim high... We might actually hit excellent every once in a while. We won't hit perfection. Perfection is out of reach in this life, but it's still the goal. (laughs) Perfection is still the goal. Now listen, when I say set no limits, the last thing I'm talking about is a holier-than-thou attitude. Because that's sin. That's not holiness. The last thing I'm talking about is living under layer after layer of legalism that you then flaunt in the face of others. Look how holy I am. Look how righteous my life is. Let me flaunt my layers after layers of legalism to you. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is a joyful life of being set apart from miserable sin and set apart to serve God with gladness. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's winsome, something that's attractive, something that's, uh, that puts a smile on your face. We're talking about something that says, listen, pursuing God to me is better than sin. That's the life of holiness. A holy person is a person that is seeking to be set apart from sin for God and loving it. <laughs> and that's what's missing in so much of our holiness. I mean, we're trying, we're striving, we know sin is bad, we know sin is damaging, but do we love holiness? That's the key. But this help tells us it's got to be in all of our behavior. It's got to be in all of our behavior. There can be no activity that is off limits or out of bounds or untouchable. No Facebook post. No Facebook post is off limits. No email, no text message, no Instagram, no conversation, no book, no vocabulary, no magazine, no website, no movie, no relationship, no pantry, no refrigerator, no hobby, no garage. Nothing can be off limits if we're going to have any success in this pursuit. It's an interesting thing that happens in the world of sports. The majority of number one draft picks in the NBA do not pan out. Oh, they're tall, they're athletic, they've been great since they were four years old. But the majority of number one draft picks in the NBA are gone within two or three years. They do not pan out. And I have a theory as to why. I think the reason is because they focus on the rewards and they dabble in basketball. They focus on all of the trappings 
and forget the calling of the sport itself. They have no clue what it takes to succeed at that level and stay at that level. And I say, oh my, my, what a picture this is of many professing Christians who start with a big emotional experience but soon fade away, soon disappear, disappear, having no clue what it takes to succeed in Christian life and staying there. And so this happens over and over and over again. A group of Christians are standing around and they say, hey, whatever happened to Jimmy? Wasn't he baptized here? Didn't he go on a summer mission trip once? Uh, Didn't he go off to a Christian college? Whatever happened to Jimmy? He's gone. He's lost. He's faded away. Why? Because Jimmy set limits on his holiness. He put boundaries. He said, God, you can go this far, but the rest is mine. And Jimmy leaves the path, the narrow path, of following the Holy One of God. When Peter talks about the call here, he's got to be having echo in his ears when the Holy One of God looked at him and said, follow me, right? Imitate me, mimic me, come behind me, become like me, follow me. We start setting limits on our holiness. We close even one door off to the to the shining light of the Holy Spirit, and we are moving down into the depths of sin at that moment. It is all, folks. It has to be all to be successful. And so they stand around and they lament and they say, wow, Jimmy, he sang love songs to Jesus on Sunday, but he left no room for Jesus when he was dating on Saturday. Oh, he loved God's blessings on the weekends, but he left no room for God at work on Monday through Friday. He set limits. He set borders. He set boundaries. When I think of setting no limits in a life and death struggle, I think of the Pacific Front in World War II. We came to this barren, volcanic island called Iwo Jima. And we looked at that island, and we knew our cause, and we said, we know our identity. Allied forces, we know our identity. We are in a righteous cause for life and death. And then we decided we will fight for every inch of this island. We will set no limits. It's either victory or death. We understood that there could be no islands of resistance that were off limits to American boots or American bombs on our way to mainland Japan. We understood that Japan's unconditional surrender was the only option. And so eventually we got real radical. We did something that's never been done in human warfare before. We loaded up little boy on Enola Gay and we did what had to be done. History has proven it. History has vindicated it. It had to be done. And then we dropped fat boy and then war was over. Because we got radical, because we set no limits, because we understood what had to be done. And that is an illustration for us in our war with sin. We can leave no territory undisturbed. No no territory that we don't shake up and rattle and, and disturb with the truth. All right, number one is know your identity. Number two, fight your propensities. Number three, set no limits. Help number four. Help number four is echo the call. Echo the call. Look at this in verse 15. But like the Holy One who called you. Like the Holy One who called you. This reminds us, doesn't it, that all holiness starts with God the Father, who is, as we read this morning, holy, holy, holy. He is the starting point. In fact, some theologians would say this is perhaps His most essential attribute. Some would say the holiness of God is the summation of all of His attributes. That it's what makes God, God. That He is utterly unique and separate and set apart. Beloved, when you and I are gazing upon God with the eyes of faith, we are gazing upon pure holiness. Now, this passage sets before us then two patterns. 
to choose from. Two schemes, two molds, if you will. The first was former lusts. It was a scheme, it was a pattern. And we are to resist that one and to fight against it. The second one is the pattern of God. Is the mold of God. Like the Holy One who called you, be holy. It was this call then that was our starting point in the experience of salvation. It was this call that began our fellowship with God. It was this call that launched us on the pursuit of holiness. This is so important that we see this. That it began with God. That God took the initiative, not us. You see, the help here is this, beloved. Our pursuit of holiness is an echo of the call of God on us. I didn't call myself. I didn't start this. God did. You didn't start this. God did. And so we just merely respond. We echo what He started. Or to say it another way, any and all holiness in our lives, any and all holiness in our lives is but an echo of this irresistible and gracious call, which is a holy call by a Holy Spirit to a holy God and a life of holiness. Now, why does this matter? Why does Peter need, need to mention this? Why does this help us? Here's the answer. When we understand that we are echoing the call, this anchors our pursuit of holiness in an intimate relationship with our Creator. So we just have a holy God over here who personally, intimately comes to us by name and calls us to himself. That's, that just raises the motivation to not sin. I'm in an intimate relationship with my creator and I want to reflect him. I want to echo what he has started in my life. This is so important because when we echo the call, not try to originate the call, we are able to move past, I have to do this, to what? I want to do this. When you move from have to to want to, you are well on your way. That makes all the difference in the world. I was watching a certain football game yesterday. A color commentator was Gary Danielson. And uh, the Vern Ludquist said to Gary Danielson, he had talked about the Alabama-Auburn game of a week ago, and he said, Gary, I know that you studied that game for this game, and you, and you watched that film uh, closely, and, and I know that you took 15 pages of notes, and that you worked, and he used the word work, he said, you worked really hard to get ready for this game, and Gary Danielson cut him off, and he said, it wasn't work, it was fun, <laughs> it was fun, and I said, oh, that's it. It's not work. It's not drudgery. It's fun being holy. Because I'm echoing the call of an intimate God who called me out of sin. Called me out of this world and called me to Himself. To give me Jesus Christ and eternal life and all manner of blessings. What could be more fun than being holy? It's not what you're denying yourself. It's what you're giving yourself. When you echo this call. Fifth and final help. Oh, this passage is just amazing to me. What is here for us? The fifth and final help is verse 16. Where Peter simply, <laughs> simply anchors this, rivets this down to the Word of God itself. He says in verse 16, because it is written, or literally because it has been written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I think that phrase is repeated some 16 times in the Bible. Peter here is starting with the first one. It's Leviticus 19.2. He quotes word for word from the Septuagint. And here is our last help. I phrased it this way. Obey the Scriptures. This stands written, he says. The sacred text has come from a divine origin and it is therefore authoritative and immovable in your life, Peter is saying. It is expressed. It is explicit. It stands written. It's fixed. It's immovable. It's permanent. Here we have it, folks. We have a permanent, written revelation of the will of God for our lives, right? Why does this matter? Here's the answer. This roots our holiness in obedience to the Bible. It's not guesswork. This roots a holy life 
in the foundation of a permanent authoritative expression of God's revealed will for all mankind. What is God's will? What is God's will? It's such a mystery. No, mystery solved. Search is over. The code has been cracked. Be holy as I am holy. That's God's will for your life. This is so freeing. This is so wonderful. There's just one book to know and adopt. It stands written. We don't have to make it up as we go. That's what we did as kids and games. We made up the rules as we went. Bit to our favor. We don't do that as Christians. We don't have to adopt situational ethics. I wonder what I should do in this situation. There is no need for situational ethics. It is written. Do you want to be as holy as God is holy? Then simply obey the Scriptures. They are the revelation of the standard and the expression of the essence of the holiness of God. He is the benchmark. He has, he has revealed it to us in the Word of God. We must properly interpret it. We must properly apply it and then obey it. So five helps, five incredible helps in our war against sin and pursuit of holiness. You must know your identity. You are a child of obedience. Number two, you must resist your propensities and fight those former lusts that once dominated and ruled. Number three, set no limits. Give no quarter. Give no food and shelter to any lust, to any sin. Number four, echo the call. You don't create it, you just echo it. And then number five, obey Scripture. Obey Scripture. Now, they told us in preaching class that every sermon is supposed to have a conclusion. Well, guess what? Today, you are the conclusion. More specifically, your coming to the table is the conclusion of this sermon. Or we might think of it like number six or a bonus help, right? The Lord's table. A bonus help to our life of holiness. It is at this table where we confess again our sins, where we renew our commitment to be obedient to Christ. It's where we receive forgiveness. So if you're a believer here today, my encouragement to you would be to confess, to repent, and to come to the table in obedience to the Bible. And allow this to be a bonus help. Allow this to be the conclusion of this sermon. Let's bow our heads.